Hello everybody and welcome to the NBA Show Reviews. Today we're going to be reviewing episode 7 of season 4, episode 72 overall. It's called Bats, written by Meriwether Williams, directed by Jason Thyssen and Big Jim Miller, and storyboarded by Jung Jang and Corey Toomey. Uh, with me I have sketchy sounds. I'm sorry darling, sketchy couldn't make it, ah! so I'm afraid you're stuck with Sati Anka today. Mm. But you know, considering that the episode is called Bats, then... I think it's completely fitting that I came along to help with you. Oh, dear. Uh, is, is the sketch safe? Is he okay? Oh, he's fine, darling. Don't worry. Uh, he oh. just got a little caught up with a few things. Don't worry about it. Oh. I'm sure he'll be back later. Oh, oh, all right. Wish him well. And I also have my lovely co-host, Norman Sanso. Hello, folks. How are you guys doing? Ah, and we have the lovely, lovely people from my, from my stream who are going to give us some feedback later on and probably get some audience participation in. So, in today's episode, we have uh, conflict happening in Sweet Apple Acres. Applejack is ready to start with her apple backing season when suddenly she discovers that her orchard has been attacked by a flock of vampire fruit bats. And that's bad. It's not good news. So, with the help of Fluttershy and the main six, they decide to corral all the all, all the fruit bats, the bumper fruit bats, and try to stop them from make, from eating all the apples before they run sweet apple acres out of business. So they corral all the creators, and using one of uh, using Fluttershy's ability of the stair, they p- keep them in place as. Twilight tries to use that one spell that she used in Trauma of the Century to change personalities and behavior because it went so well last time. And fair enough, it changes the behavior of the fruit bats. No problem. Looks like everything's solved, except the next morning, Applejack goes to back all the trees and she discovers they are still full of rotten apples. So they dun, decide. Dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. So they decide to look for the culprit in the orchard at night because, hey, what other better time of the day it is but to look for a creepy possible dangerous creature at night it's like they never watched any of the hammer horror movies and in their, <laughs> in their horror they discover that it's not the vampire fruit bats who did it but fluttershy who has turned into a bun pony it's a bad pony it's a flutter bat like Rarity says and they're like oh my god how could this happen and then twilight is like techno bubble some, somehow my spell got mixed with the stair and now Fluttershy absorbed the personality of the vampire fruit bats. So after a couple of hijinks and some fairly terrifying scenes, they managed to corral, uh, corner Fluttershy and recover her original personality. And after the episode is over, uh, they all learn that sometimes it's good to say no to what your friends tell you to do, especially when you disagree with them. And that uh, your short-term solutions might not be very helpful in the long run, and they will not work forever. They give a part of the orchard to the vampire fruit bats, and after the epi- before the episode ends, we discover that Fluttershy may not have shaken off the effects of the vampire fruit bats personality completely, as we see she still has a fan growing in her mouth. And the episode is over with another cliffhanger. It's like the cliffhanger counter is already broken. How many cliffhangers has been this season so far? Oh my God, so many. But that's bad. And now in a more paced tone and slower uh, manner, we are going to discuss the episode and see what we think of it. So, guys, what do you think of the episode? I like it. Yeah, oh, ladies I first. rather enjoyed it. Um, it was... Uh... <laughs> I thought it was well put together, mm. quite well written. Uh, the song was quite enjoyable as well. There was a song in this one, and it was an apple track song mainly, no less, as well. So it was good to see that. Um, I also quite liked the way it developed, even if it was predictable to some extent. Um, the way it was presented it was still very good. It was interesting to see Fluttershy's transformation into a uh, more of a bat-like creature. Also, a note on that. How many of you noticed that uh, Fluttershy's cutie mark transformed into a little image of three little bats rather than three little butterflies? I didn't notice when watching the episode uh, the, the the quality of the string wasn't all that good, but after rewatching it, it, it is there. It's like three uh, pink bats. It's brilliant. 
Yeah, I thought that was a really nice touch and it really contributed to it. But yeah, it was interesting seeing what they did with it. Um, and I did really like the whole way it developed. And also, in terms of uh, direction and so forth, I really, really liked the way they had... Uh, it was kind of a whole reference to... Um, Aliens, or even Alien 3, the way they had, you know, those shots where they had flat but, you know, zipping past, you know, just a silhouette. That was very reminiscent of, you know, the, the classic horror film sticks there, where, you know, you do not see the creepy creatures that's zipping around, you just see its silhouette. That was really well done. I really liked that. Or it could be John Carpenter's The Thing, because... For most of part of the movie, we won't, we don't know how the creature looks like. We know it can take shape or form yeah. of something. So, the less we know, the scarier it is. So, yeah. Uh, and yeah, what did, what about you, Norman? What did you think of the episode? Well, I, I like it. Like what Svelte says, I totally agree. Do you want me to list down what I like now? Because this is a confusing well, format. No, no, no. Say what you say. What you want? Say what you think of the episode. Then I will. Uh, I haven't said what I think of the episode yet, but. Uh, you have to say what you think of it. Well, I do like it. The whole story, the whole reference to things that happened before. And they did mention a few things like the fruit bats and how Twilight referenced them. And, you know, the, this show, I can feel that they're doing a good job on it. And I, I, I just don't know. I mean, I'm not good at words. That's why I point them out. But overall, I do like the show. There are a few things that I don't like, but I think we can save that for later. You will say that the episode shows that they are putting a lot of effort into it, and they're putting a lot of work into it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, of course. Uh, I was very wary of this episode. I was kind of, like, dreading it. Uh, and I will be honest, one of the reasons why I was dreading it, it was because I knew it was going to be a Fluttershy episode, and I knew it was Meriwether Williams working on it. Now... I have gone on record over and over again saying how I don't like most of the episodes that she's written. Most importantly, putting your hoof down, which to me is an unwatchable episode, and I just I cannot sit through it. Uh, and when I heard that she was writing another Fluttershy episode, the first thing that came to my head was, oh no, here we go again. Here we are going to completely ruin the character. We're going to make it so uninteresting. And it was wrong on my on my part. Uh, but then I watched the previews that were uh, posted in Entertainment Weekly and on TV Guide, and I realized the tone that the episode was going for, and, and I suddenly got very hyped. In my opinion, this is probably the best episode that Meriwether Williams has ever written for the show. If you think about it, it looks and, sa it looks and, and plays very similar to, uh, to a rejected episode from Adventure Time where I, I, I said this before, but you can change the characters for the characters of Adventure Time. You can change Applejack for Finn, Fluttershy for Jake, and Twilight for Princess Bubblegum. And it will, it will work perfectly as an Adventure Time episode. Uh, it's a transformation episode where one of the characters turns into something that is not. And those always uh, interest me, and they grab my attention. It's not my favorite episode of the season, but I thought it was a great episode. Very well done, very well written, very well put together, with a lot of genuinely creepy moments. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was great. True, true. I mean, uh, Mary Wendell Williams never had the best track records when doing um, most of the characters, but I think she's developing her own style. And right now, with the past few Applejack episodes with um, Spike at your service. That one was a really good Applejack episode, but a terrible Spike episode. And for this one, it's a really good Applejack episode too. It's, mm -hmm. The main focus is not really on Fluttershy. It's more to Applejack. Another thing that I quite liked was the way it was presented when Fluttershy was having her moral dilemma because you see she had on one side desire to protect these little animals, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, but on the other side, he had her friends and, you know, Apple Jack saying, well, we need to get rid of these pests because otherwise they are going to destroy my crops and so forth. 
seeing her put into that situation where she had that medal that in, uh, was very interesting. And the way she, you could see that she was struggling with it. That was very well presented. Uh, also, side notes that we had to make here, actually, now I think on it uh, in regards to all that. Um, I think we can all agree now that uh, Rainbow Dash is a, um, Alcoholic. has an alcoholism problem. Yes. Oh, yeah, she has because, a problem. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. How much was she like, want someone to think of this either? <laughs> it's like, yeah, you have a problem, darling. <laughs> you should have that looked at that. Yeah. I think, you're, you know, I think your friends are going to have to hold an intervention at some point. <laughs> That's something that uh, both Meriwether Williams and Dave Polsky, they like to do that. They, they they like to focus on that one aspect of the character and exploit it for <laughs> comedic purposes. In my opinion, this works because we know how Dash is so enthusiastic about Cider and how much she likes Cider. She doesn't want to lose that one thing that she likes. That is like when you tell her that when they tell her that there is going to be a delay on the de- next day in Do book, and it's not going to come out for another two months. Yeah. So he's like, yeah. "Oh God, why?" Um, yeah, that was actually very well portrayed. Um, she is very passionate, is that Rainbow Dash? It has to be said. You know, there are there are only a few things in life it seems that she is really, really into. But those few things, she is, you know, she puts her heart and her soul into them. Like, as you said, with the Daring Do books and with the Cider, you know, these are things that she really, really loves. So you say to her that she cannot have them, and, you know, it is the worst thing ever for her. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like the world is ending for <laughs> her. She wants to, like, she, she wants to end everything because, oh, my God, I'm going to lose the Cider. Uh, the conflict in this episode was very well portrayed as well. Like, uh, in, 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 for example, in putting your hoof down, the, uh, I'm using this one as an example, not only because it's not an episode that I really like, but also because it's an episode, <coughs> or it's a Fluttershy episode written by the same writer. And in that episode, the conflict seems fabricated. It seems like it came out of nowhere. Mm. This one is a lot more sensible, and it, it makes a lot more sense. Because you have... The, the Apple family, with having a problem with these vampire fruit bats, they are the sole providers of apples for Ponyville. Had they yeah. lose that, they'd be in deep. That's not a word. So, yeah. They, yeah, they really, really need to solve this situation. Applejack doesn't want to wait until the situation can be fixed by itself. She doesn't want to relocate the bats. She wants to get, she wants to get rid of them. That's like when yeah. you get a, when you get an ant infestation in your house. You don't try to reason with the ants or try to move them. You That's f- not a word. Squash them. That is the thing, you know. That is what I was saying before. You know, you could see that Fluttershy was very aware of all of these factors. That yes, these animals need somewhere to live, but at the same time, um, you know, as the question was posed to her, you know, is it right to allow these bats also to, you know to destroy this crop. Is that right by you either? You could see she was genuinely struggling with it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, in the end, she made the decision to, you know, to side with her friends and Mm. uh, do what she thought needed to be done. But, of course, then we saw how that turned out. Also, continuity, continuity, continuity. is like they bring back the stair, they talk about... Uh, Dash's passion for cider. They mentioned the uh, Appleback season is back. Uh, they, they they didn't quite explain why Big Macintosh, Apple Bloom, and Granny Smith were not there, but at least they tried to give an explanation. It was hand waving and kind of like excusey, but it, it it's there. At least it's something. Kim in the chat uh, asked, "What do you guys think of the song?" The song was very Danny Elfman ish. Mm. Yeah, there was a um, there was someone I was talking to the other day said it sounded very Soviet. <laughs> uh, and I was like, you know, I sort of get that. I can see where you're coming from. I just have to point out as well something that uh, Hizzle has said. He said uh, the song he said stops the bats, kicks them out. Can't help but feel that that could be reinterpreted as some anti-bat pony rhetoric. <laughs> and yeah, you know, I have to agree with him there. You know, it could easily be. 
reinterpreted and misused to, you know, <laughs> to express racist. this taste for my kind. And yeah, yeah, exactly. That is racist. You know what? I you love, know, pa- we I don't love, want you to be doing that. I love bad ponies. You guys are awesome and cute and adorable and fun. But yeah, I can totally see why someone might reinterpret it as, you know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but to me, I'm seeing there's a problem with most of the songs for season four. They're not memorable. <laughs> I don't agree with you. Really? I think, uh, yeah, I think Horse as Strong as, uh, Hearts as Strong as Horses was uh, fairly weak. I agree with you on that one. Yeah, it might, be, it might be a bit weak of a song. But I think this song is fairly memorable. I, I, I'll say that uh, I can, I can it, it doesn't, okay, I can see what you mean. It doesn't have a normal uh, metric. The meter is quite unorthodox in that it doesn't follow uh, a normal rhythm. And it sounds like the characters are talking in rhyme as the music is playing in the background. But that's how most of Danny Elfman's and Tim Burton's songs uh, work. They don't necessarily need to be in rhyme or with a, with a tune. That's mm. why it, you might find it difficult to, to, to rhyme along. In my opinion, I thought it was very memorable from the get-go. That's true, but yeah. I'm trying to remember hard about the song, and it's not stuck in my head. That's the thing. Like, there are a few songs in season one, two, three, it's stuck in my head. I can't get them out, even if I don't listen to them for a while. I mean, Hearts as Strong as fruit Horses. Patron, the fruit Patron, the... <laughs> that one. <laughs> I do have to say, though, the... Uh... If you if you hum what my cutie mark is telling me the 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 season the season three the season three finale song and then you try to sing this one you're going to get confused because they sound very very similar. Hmm. Oh, okay. Just well, look uh, look into it. Put them back to back. You're going to notice similarities between both of them. Okay, I'll take your word for it. But yeah, I mean it's it's. It's a very good song. It's very uh, in the in the terms of Danny Elfman, that, um, Nightmare Before Christmas. You could expect Jack Skellington to come out at, uh, out of there and say, "This is bad country. This is bad country. Yeah. Bad country. Bad country." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you totally could actually. So uh, you can't stop here. This is bad country. It's just having fun on this episode. And the visuals during the entire song were great. Not mm. let, let alone during the entire episode. Um, the design of Fluttershy as a vampire pony is amazing. That was really good, yeah. I yeah. really, really liked that. It, yeah. uh, you know, it worked so well with the big bad things on the... And her tail changed a bit as well, and her mane, and, and her eyes even turned red. Mm. Yeah. That her, was quite the touch. Yeah, she has uh, red eyes, and if you notice, the outline of her eyes, like the black outline, it's even darker and bigger. It's like thicker. So the, 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 uh, the um, facial features are in enhanced. She has those uh, teeth, and the, the, the ears are also changed. They are fluffier. Oh, my God, fluffy ears. Mm. It's adorable <laughs> and scary at the same time. It's so awesome. And... If you remember this, this one scene where the main six are walking towards the camera, uh, screaming Fluttershy's name, calling for her, and then you see the three tops from the background, and one of the three tops turns into Fluttershy, and she flies away. And I'm like, when does this movie, t- when does this series turn into aliens? <laughs> this is creepy. <laughs> yeah, that that goes back to what I was saying earlier. The way the way those scene, scenes were shot, so to speak, the way they were post on everything, the way they were storyboarded, you could tell that they had taken a lot of uh, leaves out of the Aliens book and so forth, and it worked really, really well. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, the, uh, the referencing, it's visible to those who are older and who have seen those films, but to those who haven't, you know, they're going to really enjoy it because it's been really well done. It's a proven cinematic technique and it works. Mm, true. Also, I have to say, actually, um, with regards to that whole bit, uh, as you were saying, James, it was very well designed in terms of the lighting, the way it was posed, and the the use of light and shadow. Um, and that's been a general trend throughout the series so mm-hmm. far, actually, throughout the season. They've taken much more care with their use of lighting and everything. Mm. Um, yeah. It's become so much more evident. They have made, they, they, they have, uh, there was a lot of atmosphere previously in My Little Pony. There was a, uh, this sense of like, you know, magical kingdom and everything. This season, they amped the atmosphere 
a whole lot more. Like the, 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 the magical moments are more magical. The scary moments are, are scarier and the, the action adventure moments are more actiony and adventure. It's like they, they crank the level up to 11 and it's, it, it feels, it feels like it. Yeah. They are simply getting bolder in what they are doing is what it is. Yeah, exactly. They're like taking more risks, which is similar to what they were doing in season two. Mm. And talking about film style and direction, did you guys notice in the song, when Applejack sang her song, they used a day for night shot? Yes, you're, you're right, because when Applejack is singing, everything looks dark and desaturated, and when Fluttershy is singing, everything looks colorful and bright. They, they Because it's like Fluttershy is trying to look on the positive side and trying to look for a peaceful solution, while Applejack is like, squash, kill, destroy. Crush, kill, destroy, swag. <laughs> <laughs> Apples. I, I'm just a bit. <laughs> I'm just a bit shocked that they did the day for night shot because if you think about it, they could have just used night normally. They don't even need to use the blue tint on the screen like all those bad movies do. Yeah, but, I mean, here is the thing, so the ho- you can see the whole reason why they did that was because, you know, it was a whole theme of Apple, like, going, oh, these are terrible creatures and we need to get rid of them. And, you know, it it added to the atmosphere of portraying these vampires as scary, scary creatures. Because think about it for a moment. How ridiculous would it have looked if Apple, like, had been prowling around with this cape over her <laughs> in broad daylight? No, I mean, I, I don't mean that. I mean... Um, the animators could have easily turned the day into night with a flip of the switch. But they did that extra touch by using the day for night um, technique that is prevalent in every bad movie. Like, if you want to see day for night shot, go look at the review from the cinema snob. It's always there. Also, I don't know if I'm the only one who noticed it, but uh, if you think about it, every single episode that had to deal with the introduction of a really scary or very fear, uh, 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 fearful uh, creature involves Fluttershy. <laughs> like, you have Dragon Shy, it's mm-hmm. a Fluttershy versus a dragon. Uh, the Stair Master, Fluttershy versus the Cockatrice. We, mm-hmm. we get introduced to the, to the stair for the first time. Uh, putting your hoof down, Fluttershy versus Iron Will. Uh, uh, keep calm on Flutter on, Fluttershy versus Goddamn Discord. Oh, uh, and don't forget to mention now, um, the Hydra. Yeah, the Hydra, that, that's right. Well, that was kind of like tangentially related. But yeah, Flutter's High uh, facing the Hydra in, in Feeling Pinky Kin. So, to be honest with you, uh, not only does it make a lot of sense to have Flutter's High, the animal caretaker, in the, in, in the role of taking care of these animals, but I think it's kind of foreshadowed that uh, Flutter's High, for spending so much time with these creatures, she would end up turning into one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is, it is, it makes so much sense. Like, also, yeah. As Liteki has just said in the chat, yeah, Fluttershy is the beast master. <laughs> she is the beast master. She definitely, she is the beast master. She has a pet bear. Not even the beast master had a pet bear. He had a, a, a black tiger, that- a falcon, and, a, and two ferrets. <laughs> but you see, here is the thing, actually, that bear is not really her pet, so. That's the funny thing. Is it, it is really more her friend. You know, yeah, it just comes by when it needs a massage. Yeah, better word in there, by <laughs> the way. she wrestles it. It is, it is, it is her friend. Her friend. Um, also, I like that head cannon that I don't know who it was, but they made a post on their Piburu. Uh, I think you showed it to me, uh, Svelte, that I went to check, uh, you, ch- uh, you showed me a picture of uh, Fluttershy saying, okay, Fluttershy was able to uh, tame this court. She was able to change her body size, and now she has one solitary fang. Fluttershy is slowly turning into a Draconicus. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, that, that was on Twitter, but yeah, that was, um, that was something someone had tweeted, and they said, okay, you know, uh, crackpot fancy every time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she, she has hypnosis-like powers, she has been shown to, you know, distort her body size because of, you know, power ponies. And <laughs> now we have seen she has got a permanent, you know, single fang. Okay. But is slowly turning into a draconic <laughs> All right, all right. He, uh, my, my head cannon for the fangs is, it's not one single fang, it's actually two fangs. But the angle that the scene was shown at was to the side, so we only see one fang. I will be okay if this is never addressed again. Oh, yeah. 
in the in the series, I I will be okay with that because that to be honest with you, the the, the ending joke of ah oh, the single solitary fan, that is, that is still it goes with the Adven- Adventure Time esque <laughs> feel and tone that the, the entire episode has. Adventure Time has had many of these episodes where. Uh, the episode ends with a cliffhanger or kind of like a shout out or like a, a, a joke and they never address it again uh, because yeah. it's adventure time. You don't need to. <laughs> uh, true, true. But uh, if they go back to it and they, there, is sudden, there is an episode where suddenly Fluttershy falls into the, into the hunger and she has to go feed on apples. I will be completely yeah. fine with it, with either option. Like it, it will be fun, though. Yeah. Honestly speaking, it won't, but it would be fun. Like shows like this in general, they won't go that far for a um, a joke. It's not like Adventure Time, where this episode says something, the next one doesn't, the next one doesn't. Five episodes later, ooh, reference back to the previous episode where something happened. Yeah, uh, Adventure Time has a very weird continuity, but mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. does make sense within the universe because it's everything random. Yeah, true, but true. it keeps th- things flowing. MLP is still figuring that out. I can mm-hmm. feel that Megan McCarthy is working hard to make the show have a continuity and a sense of like uh, expansion and like, okay, we're going to move on this one now and then that and then oh my god, we're going to have a throwback to this episode that you guys might not remember. But being you, Bronis, I'm pretty sure you remember everything because oh, my god. Indeed, indeed. Well, I mean, if you think about it, there was actually a hint of that even in this episode, because when was the last time we actually saw Fluttershy use this there? It was all the way back in Stair Master. No, really. that was in season one. No, no, she used the, she used the stair on Discord and it didn't work out. Yeah, that was in season three. And she also did use the stair on the premiere for season four. It was not blatant about it, but she did open her eyes wide and got mad. So the stair was there. Uh, when right. did she when did she do that? I don't remember her doing that <clears throat> in the premiere. When she was blackmailing Discord. Oh, okay. When he's like, and if you want to still be friends, you better help us out clean up. <laughs> yes. Was that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. fine. Put it on the windows. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Okay, I remember now what you mean, Norman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right. So, huh. So, okay, I think we can give, like, final verdicts. Yeah. Um, ladies first. Well, you know what I am going to say. I mean, you know, any episode that is going to have, uh, you know, a bad pun is of a kind in it. That's always going to get a hoofs up from me. <laughs> but uh, in all honesty, yeah, I enjoyed this episode. Uh, it was well-rounded. It was quite well-written. It had some very fun moments. Um, I would not say that it is, like, my favorite of the season so far. But uh, nevertheless, it was very well done, and I quite enjoyed it. So, uh, yeah, it gets my approval. Come on, as I say, it has a you know, lot of bat in it. How can I not say yay to that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, true. Oh, well, as for me, I like this episode. It it talks about a lot of things, and I especially like the part, how it handles um, peer pressure, because if you think about it, this episode is all about peer pressure with how they handle it and how they brought it up because Slatisha is not comfortable in doing the stare, but she's pressured by her friends to do it. And, you know, with everything, there's a consequences. Um, there's a consequences? That's the word, right? Or bad? Yeah. yeah. Okay. With yeah. that word. And when they force something, Slatisha turns into a bat and everybody needs to run and hide and Pinky by dug a hole with her hair and so on. And, well, they handle this episode of peer pressure much better than other episodes that handle this kind of situation. In my opinion, this is definitely my favorite Mary Weather Williams written mm-hmm. episode. I have bashed on her on the past, and I have bashed on her to the point that it stopped being funny. And But I always had that silver lining of... I know she's getting better. I know the next episode is going to be good. It's coming. Guys, believe me, that episode is coming. And when Spike at Your Service was first premiered, I was one of the few people who will openly and uh, uh, faithfully defend it as an episode where the focus of the episode wasn't good and everything else was good. Because mm. every episode, every character was in character except Spike. Mm. I knew that. I knew that if Meriwether Williams had another episode she'd be able to pull it off. And I think she really did. 
-hmm. This is the episode that made me believe that Meriwether Williams is a perfect writer for this show. Mm -hmm. In that she finally gets the character, she finally gets the tone. She does. Uh, she does have a very good rhythm, when, uh, sense of rhythm when it comes to the writing. Very good dialogue, and uh, uh, yes, wonderful visuals uh, from beginning to end. This is this is going to go down as one of my favorite episodes in the entire series, mm -hmm. and it changed me from a Meriwether Williams apo apologist to a Meriwether Williams defender. Mm -hmm. Like now, I am hyped for her next episode. Okay. And cool. I, she better not disappoint, but she's not <laughs> going to disappoint because she's a good writer. Indeed. Well, um, Leteki on the live stream chat uh, says this: funny how people accuse Flutterbat of pandering, and to be honest, I don't think so. Um, Everything that is shown in the whole scene makes sense. It's not here. Yeah. Here's something. Throw pandas at you. Well, I mean, this is what he's saying. He's, he's saying, it is funny that they accuse me of that of being pandering. And he's saying, you know, this is not South Park with episodes being done in a week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is very true. I mean, there has not been, you know, there was no, there was not as big of a hype surrounding us, bad ponies, which is quite frankly shocking. I mean, have you seen us? <laughs> but anyway, there was not as big of a hype surrounding our kind until quite recently. No, true. So, yeah, it is hardly pandering. I mean, the people that would accuse that of being pandering obviously do not realize how long these things take to do oh, yeah. because it takes a very, very long time to put together an episode. Yeah. The things that we are seeing every week at the moment... Those were made like over a year ago for the most part. Do you guys remember Alicorn Twilight Sparkle? <laughs> that that script was written in 2011 and the episode <laughs> yeah. was premiered early this year. Yeah, huh? yeah. Like that was like two years in the making. They cannot throw pandas at us <laughs> because there is no time for them to throw pandas at us. Mm -hmm. So to be honest with you, I agree with you guys in that it, this is not <laughs> South Park. They cannot work um, that that hard that fast James, James, yes. James Darling, what you mean is they do not have time to panda to us <laughs> you don't mean that they can throw pandas at us no but that's what <laughs> that I like I, I, I'm a different thing and you know that will get you in trouble with the World Wildlife Fund <laughs> I, you know I use that I use that in the, the same term that uh, Saber Spark uses it like <laughs> they're throwing pandas at us oh, do you mean panda <laughs> uh, fun fact guys that's, um, um, oh, did you know that yeah. Josh Harbour, when he wrote the script for um, Castlevania, it was done two years ago. Wow. Wow, wow. Yeah. So it, took, it takes that long for him to finish and submit and make it done. To him, it could be... Oh, like this in... a miserable pile of friendship! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, James, what's next? Okay. Next week's episode is not next week's episode, it's next year's episode. No. That's right. What a way dun, to end dun, it. Dun. <laughs> okay, next <laughs> next year's episode, next week's episode is going to be episode 8 of season 4. And it's a bit funny episode, oh my god! Oh. Uh, it's oh, a... Yeah. Uh, rarity Rarity. Rarity. <laughs> rarity. Rarity takes Manhattan. Ooh. Written by Dave Polsky mm -hmm. and storyboarded by Sabrina Albergeri. Uh, what happens when Rarity decides to go to a fashion week in Manhattan and suddenly hijinks ensue? <laughs> and it's going to be a perfect episode. It's, it's going to be great because Best Pony is in it and you know it's going to be awesome. Okay. Well, that sounds like it's gonna be fun. I, yeah, I know. I'm, I am as hyped for this episode as I was for Power Ponies, and I loved Power Ponies. Mm. Completely disregarded all the. Like, I mean, yeah. you you are a big Rarity fan, so it is no surprise. <laughs> One of the sections in my Tumblr is called Raritopia. Yes, I am a big Rarity fan. <laughs> yeah, oh, guys, I, I think we forget to mention Rarity wearing a hazmat suit. Oh god, yes! How did you wear the hazmat suit? Was fucking awesome. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was cute. Uh, that was cute. <laughs> it was adorable. She's like, ah, I'm wearing a hazmat suit. Oh no, gross, gross, gross! Ew, 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 ew. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's hilarious. Oh my god, it's killing me. Well, this has been for today's episode review. I have been James Cork. I have been Norman Sanzo. And I have been Sveti Yanka. You'll be seeing me in your dreams. Well, I know I will. If only. If only. <laughs>
<laughs> See you guys the next year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, guys. Have a good fun. Don't get too drunk. <laughs> Bye and be safe.